Hey everybody, welcome to the video. So I'm breaking down the Food City Dirt Race at Bristol Motor Speedway on Sunday, March 28th at around 3.30 p.m. Eastern. And yes, you did hear me correct. We are going dirt track racing at Bristol on Sunday. It's going to be an absolutely chaotic race. And, and I'm just going to throw this out there that I'm a little bit indifferent on the idea of the dirt track. At first, I was like, well, we're losing a Bristol race. I was really against it. But I like that NASCAR is trying new things. It just sucks that it's at the expense of a regular Bristol race because I think Last year in Jeff Glux, was it a good race pool? I'm pretty sure this Bristol Spring Race last year was the highest rated race in the entire year. I think it was like at 95% that it was a good race, and I totally agree. It was a fantastic race, and I typically do well at Bristol from a DFS perspective, so it really sucks that we're losing this race instead of having the dirt race as an additional race, maybe having three Bristol races this year. So that's just kind of my opinion on that. I know a lot of people have strong opinions either way, whether they're 100% fully on the board for this dirt race, and some people are fully against it. I'm somewhere right in the middle. It just makes things a bit tougher from a DFS perspective because we have no course history whatsoever at dirt tracks. We've never ran at Bristol on a dirt track before, anything like that. So it's definitely going to be a bit interesting this week. So bear with me, guys. We're doing this together, and it's going to be a very, very interesting week. And with that being said, I can't imagine this video is going to be as long as the usual ones, which I'm sure a lot of you are jumping up and down very happy about that because there's just not as much stuff to talk about. Like, and we're at a mile and a half track. We can talk about green flag speeds from last year and this year. We can talk about track types, how they did in 2020, 2021, steep tracks, whatever you want to call it. We have nothing to work with this week. So we're going to talk about strategy and things like that because this week it's pretty much all about strategy. And whoever has the right strategy, it's probably going to do well for fantasy this weekend. But before we get into it, make sure you leave a like on the video if you find this helpful in any way possible. Subscribe to the channel if you're new. We're inching close to 8,000 subscribers, so that's really cool. I do appreciate that. And if you help support the channel over on Patreon, link is down below for that. But I do have a special announcement this week for the Patreon page, and it's actually free content if you guys are interested. So I actually teamed up with someone to be able to provide you guys a personal optimizer for NASCAR each and every single week for the rest of the season. And it's not some basic optimizer or anything crappy like that. It can do every single thing that Fantasy Cruncher can do, and it'll be in addition to one of my Patreon tiers that I will add starting next month. But for this weekend only, it's absolutely free to use. I'll put a link down below. And I have a tutorial video on how to use that. I have the login information, everything you need to know. So if you want to try it out this weekend, it is completely free. It's going to have my own projections on there, including my ownership projections, which are new as well. I'll be, I'll be updating that late tonight and tomorrow morning and probably tomorrow afternoon as well as I don't have as much time as I like to work on it for most weeks because we had to wait until Saturday evening to record this video when usually I know the starting order by like the time the race is over on Sunday. So we're a little bit behind in that aspect. But again, if you guys want to try that out, link down below and if you like it we'll be adding a new patreon tier that includes the optimizer and all the other stuff like the articles projections green flag speed cheesies every single thing that you see on my spreadsheet and the projections they've been kind of low-key on fire recently as we've had two back-to-back -back weeks with guys taking down 150 max tournaments and the week before that we had six guys in the top 10 so we're on a bit of a hot streak here so hoping that continues in bristol i know this is going to be a bit of a crazy week so it's definitely a good week to go light but i still think we can have have a pretty solid week assuming we have the right strategy heading into sunday and also really quick baseball starts on thursday so if you really like baseball and you want to play daily fantasy sports for it at least try it out i have a mega spreadsheet available on patreon for that which is probably even bigger than my NASCAR spreadsheet. So if you like a lot of information, I do that each and every single day. I'll be on the Osmo Live before lock streams as well. If you want to follow me over on there, and I'll post daily videos too. So lots of content coming, and I am very excited for it. People really seem to like the baseball content. So if you're new, I'm hoping you'll like it as well if you happen to check it out. If you want to follow me over on social media, Chris Pinnell 16 on Twitter, CPen16 over on IG. And if you want to get a free money bonus, be $50 over on Monkey Night Fight. Use code CPen. Use the link down below and tell them I sent you. It's an instant match, $50, and they have a really fun site to play on picking what drivers can score over a certain amount of points, and you can go 2x, 3x. I know there's even a crazy contest where you can almost go 100x your money, so if you want to check it out, use my projections or things like that, feel free to do that. You get a free money bonus up to $50 using code CPEN, but I think that's it for the shameless plugs, and let's get into the preview of this week's video. And just a couple things before we get started. So if you want to know the live stream schedule this weekend, same as usual, I'll be live right here on the channel that you're at right now on Sunday at 11 a.m. Eastern, answering all the questions that you have and just kind of hanging out and having a good time. That's kind of all we do in my live streams. Nothing too serious. I say everything I really want to say in this video right now, and that's just kind of a fun hangout live stream. So if you want to join, we usually have a several hundred people in there. It's always a good time. Then if you want to follow me to the after party over on Osmo's YouTube channel for the Osmo Live Before Lock Show, 
Feel free to do that. It'll be at around 2.30 or 3 p.m. Eastern. and We'll lead you up until lock. And something new this week, I will not only be with Jason Floyd, but I'll also be joined by the ever so handsome Philip Benison as my co-analyst, which thank goodness, because I do not want to be on that show myself, because there is going to be a lot, a lot of questions about this new track and how we're going to approach this. So I'm very thankful Phil is going to be with me and help me out. We're going to help each other out and hopefully help you guys out as well. And most importantly, if you guys want to join the DraftKings contest that I host each and every single week, always a fun time. And it's just a really fun way for me to interact with you guys, see what kind of lineups you're building, and you can win some money and get some shout outs on the channel as well. So it's a win-win situation. But I'll put the winners on the screen right now. We'll shout out the podium. So bringing home the gold, Giselle 10. That's how you say your name. I apologize if not. But a massive score of nearly 400 points beat the competition by quite a bit here. So shout out to you. You had a fantastic lineup. And Mike Yo coming in second, who's also Mailman Mike on Discord, so shout out to you. And then September 9th, I believe they're newish to the channel. I think it's the first time they joined, and then they immediately joined on Patreon after that, so I do appreciate it, but that's going to round out the podium there. And then just on the bubble, we had Trent Wade, G Money the Don, Sheba941, B Tabor82, and then GM Diddy D. And so shout out to you guys. You all had fantastic lineups this weekend. And if you want to join, all you got to do is comment your DK username down below. And make sure you do it quick because the contest usually does fill pretty quick. Now, it might not fill as quick as usual because I'm putting this video out on Saturday night compared to on like Friday evening. So just comment your DK username down below. Say something nice with it. Say something mean. I don't really care. I'll send you that invite. And if, once you join, you'll be in the contest and you'll have a chance to compete for some prizes and some shout outs so that we do every single week on the channel. So I think that's pretty much it for the announcements and housekeepings and all those kind of things. So I think without further ado, let's get into the preview of this race. So like I mentioned earlier, this is the Food City Dirt Race at Bristol Motor Speedway. There is not your outline of the track, but there's your picture of the track. And yes, there is a lot of dirt on there. So if you're looking at past Bristol numbers, don't do that because that's a waste of time because it's it's completely different. It's not the same surface anymore. And this is a dirt short track and it's also pretty steep as well. It's about a half mile in length. And instead of the usual 500 laps at Bristol, we cut that in half at 250. And one thing I should mention is that the stages did get changed very recently. I think about a couple of hours ago, Bob actually tweeted out that there's going to be some new information on how these stages are going to work. So the first two stages are going to be 100 laps apiece, and the last stage is going to be 50 laps. And that's mainly due to the high tire wear that we saw in practice. Like these guys' tires... I think it was Brad Keselowski's tire they were showing in the after practice or whatever it was. His tire was like pretty much gone. He was not the only one. And also, within those stages, there's going to be competition caution. So in stage one, there's going to be a competition caution on lap 50. And then we're going to have the stage in and a lap 100. Then lap 150 in stage two, which would be 50 laps in. We're going to have another competition caution. And then obviously, we're going to have the stage break 50 more laps in. So they're really kind of concerned about that tire wear that they saw in practice. So there's going to be a lot of competition cautions here in stage break. So that's just something to keep in mind during this race. And since we have 250 laps, we're going to have 175 dominator points available, which is not a ton, but it's still not a vacant. So we're definitely going to want to at least try to get some dominator points in there. Although the way I'm treating this race is mostly as a super speedway because they have never raced on a track like this before. So what are we really going to expect here? Yes, we had practice, but these guys aren't really pushing each other as much as they would in a real race. So it's kind of hard to translate the racing we saw in practice to an actual race when they're competing for points and money and things like that. So I think for the most part, this should be a pretty chaotic race. And I'm assuming we're going to get quite a bit of cautions. And regular Bristol actually produces a decent amount of cautions as well. So now that we have dirt on here, a lot of these guys don't have much dirt experience whatsoever. And we have cup cars on dirt, which is not something we usually have. So I'm assuming there's going to be quite a bit of wrecks and cautions this week. So I think the safest strategy that we can go with this week is probably just stack in the back for the most part not saying we have to pick the guys starting 35th through 39th but targeting drivers starting further in the back is probably going to be the way to go here your lineups might look pretty similar to a super speedway this week like guys like ty dillon he's starting in the very back this week i think he's probably one of the safest options on the board yes we have some really good drivers starting closer to the front like cal larson who will be dropping to the rear you have Denny Hamlin, Ryan Blaney, Kyle Busch, those kind of guys. I'm not saying we should fade them, but they're definitely much more riskier plays because I'm not really sure how the dominator points are going to be. Is it going to be just one guy? If Kyle Larson was starting on the pole and not dropping to the rear, I would say, yeah, Kyle Larson's probably our main dominator. But since he's going to the rear now, then it really opens the door for the dominator points, at least early on, to be spread out. So the strategy for me, the safe way to go is you're going to be stacking these drivers starting 
further in the back. Now, if you want in tournaments, I don't hate targeting some drivers up front that can pick up some dominator points and hopefully finish up there because that's what you're certainly going to need because there's a lot of good place tip differential drivers in this race. I will tell you that. But I think that's kind of it for the preview for the most part. I guess one other thing I could say is that there's going to be no live pit stops, meaning that drivers cannot gain or lose positions on pit road this week. They just have to finish their service in a certain amount of time. So, so that could be one thing that works into an advantage of a guy starting closer to the front where if they could just hold that front position the entire race and just keep getting good restarts and things like that could work in their advantage for dominator points but it's kind of really about it for that so let's get into the driver by driver breakdown portion of this video which won't take as long as usual because i don't have as much information to talk about to be honest all right so we're going to start up top with the man himself kyle larson twelve thousand dollars coming off an absolute dominant performance last week where he led nearly every single lap besides the most important one ryan blaney got him at the very end but he is the clear favorite. I mean, we all knew this at the start of the season. Kyle Larson at a dirt track. I mean, when he was suspended last year, I feel like every single day I was reading the news that Kyle Larson was winning a dirt race and whatever he was doing. So, yeah, he is definitely the clear favorite here. That's going to reflect in the Vegas odds as well. Now, my spreadsheet looks a bit different this week. I was actually able to add practice times, which is one thing I was really looking forward to because I haven't been able to do that in a long, long time. So, we do have some practice information to look at now. Is the track going to be changing? Yes. I'm not sure exactly how useful the practice information will be, but it's at least nice to look at and see what drivers were fast in those practice sessions. And the one thing for Kyle Larson, I don't think we should be surprised here, but he was pretty much first in everything. In the practice number one, first in the five lap, 10 lap, and 15 lap. And then if we go to practice number two, he was first in those as well. And if we look at the Vegas odds, which I did add some new things to the spreadsheet. Now, I barely have any information on here. As you can see, I have some Eldora numbers, some recent finishes at Eldora uh, projections, which I will put in later. Then I have these Vegas odds in the practice. And I also have experience at Bristol Dirt in recent weeks. Now, obviously, these, all, these guys all have experience now because they had some practice. But before I made the spreadsheet was before practices so i had a couple guys that did get some experience in not in cup cars or anything but still they just had some track time at bristol which is better than nothing compared to what most guys will have this week but looking at the vegas odds kyle larson opened as the heavy favorite as he should have he was at 250 went up to 325 but it still ranks first of all drivers and yeah he's obviously the guy to beat here we could look at some outdoor numbers but you gotta keep in mind this is on trucks and it's just it's not it's not really the same. He did win in 2016, but we all know Kyle Larson is definitely the guy to beat on dirt in his car. Equipment's not going to matter too much this week, but I was reading some driver quotes, and some guys did say equipment's still going to at least matter a bit this week. It's not going to be like where we're going to see a Quinn Half come up front and dominate or anything like that. The guys up front are probably the guys you're going to expect to be up front for the most part because that dirt experience is going to come out, but you're also going to need a good equipment combination as well, which Kyle Larson certainly has. I mean, I think he pretty much is the championship favorite at this point, as good as he's looked this season so far. But the one thing that's going to make Kyle Larson an extremely, extremely risky play this week, for starters, he has zero place differential upside to a lot of these other guys that are good at dirt tracks have some place differential upside and they're a bit cheaper but the big thing is that he's going to be starting from the rear because he's had some engine issues in practice so now he's going to have to work his way through the field and he's going to be by some guys that obviously don't have much dirt experience and who's to say that he just doesn't get wrecked by some random driver who got loose and couldn't handle the track I mean that is certainly in the cards here and he's going to He's going to start the race with like negative 30 some points. He's a major risk here because he's not a guarantee to get back up front. I know he's still the Vegas favorite, even though he is dropping to the rear. I mean, Vegas knows that. They are smart people. They don't have the big fancy hotels for being wrong all the time. Just the problem is, from a fantasy perspective, just to say he's going to get up front and dominate, he could still get a top five finish. But at his price point and considering where he's starting, he's going to have to lead a significant amount of laps and win this race, which is not a guarantee. Now, if I had to pick anyone to win this race, I would say Kyle. Larson but from a fantasy perspective at $12,000 he gets us no place differential upside and guys like Christopher Bell and Tyler Reddick all starting below him those guys are both really good at dirt tracks especially Christopher Bell and they offer you some place differential upside and they're not starting from the rear as well so Kyle Larson if you want to fade him I don't hate it because I still think because of the name and where we're at and the Vegas odds and everything like that people are going to play him and especially if people have no idea that he's dropped into the rear there might be a lot of casual fans that played this week because it's Bristol dirt it's something new they might try to play fantasy for it, but I'm, I'm going to say, be very careful with Kyle Larson exposure this week. If he's going to, let's just throw out a number, if he's going to be 30% in the field on Sunday, I would not mind being underweight on that at all. That's just a random number. I don't think he's going to be 30% at this point, especially with the news that he's dropping to the rear, but I would not mind being underweight on Kyle Larson because there is definitely a lot of things that, a lot of bad things that could happen to him as he charges through the field, which I think he will do, but he could very easily get wrecked out in a very chaotic race as well. So sorry about that. I feel like that was pretty long winded, but that was the Kyle Larson spiel. And I mean, 
it's interesting in tournaments because it's the ownership will be lower because if he's dropping to the rear, it's just there's so many bad things that could go wrong for him. But anyway, dropping down to Chris Ribot, eleven thousand dollars. He's a thousand dollars cheaper than Kyle Larson, starting fourteen spots further back, and he also doesn't have to drop to the rear. And his dirt track resume is not as good as Kyle Larson. I mean, he's he's right up there with them, and he's actually got the second best odds in Vegas this week. Now, his practice numbers in the long run did not look that great, but I'm not willing to put too much stock into that. I still think he's going to have one of the best cars in the field, and he should contend for a win here. His odds went from 700 to 800, which I do think is a bit interesting, but still, I mean, he's going to be one of the guys to beat here. And starting 15th, I'd have to say it's probably one of my more favorite plays in the entire slate, especially from this expensive price tier. But looking at the Adore numbers in three races, he has an average finish of four, has a win, two top fives, 128 laps led, and a lot of laps ran as well. And yeah, it's kind of it for like the information we can talk about. Chris Rebell is just one of the best dirt track racers in the entire field here. So I think he should definitely be a contender. I like where he's starting. I like him more than Kyle Larson. He's got good equipment in Joe Gibbs. So I'm definitely high on Chris Rebell here. Same goes for Tyler Reddick. He's got a good dirt track resume as well. He's got the ninth best odds in Vegas to win this race. He looked pretty good in practice. If you're looking at practice one, the 10 lap averages, he was eighth. And then 15 lap, he was third. You got to keep in mind, not a lot of people are in 15, 20 some laps. I think the best thing to look at is probably the 10 lap data, which pretty much every single driver did for the most part. And then if we extend that to practice number two, he was third in the 10 lap and second in the 15 lap. So Tyler Reddick starting all the way back in 27. That's going to be really hard to pass him up. I think he's an excellent play in cash games. You can obviously play him in tournaments as well. If you can play him and Bell together, I would not mind that whatsoever. But definitely big on Tyler Reddick here. He's got some outdoor numbers to look at as well. No laps led in three races, but an average finish of 6.3 and two top five finishes. So I'm definitely in on Tyler Reddick here. Then as for Ricky Stenhouse Jr., we have no Eldora numbers to look at, but he's actually a pretty good dirt racer. He's got plenty of experience and his odds in Vegas. I mean, they're not amazing. He's got the he's got the 14th best odds to win in Vegas, but I still don't think he's a bad tournament pivot off of guys like Reddick, Bell, even Chase Briscoe. I imagine Chase Briscoe be one of the more chalkier drivers in the entire field being below $10,000 starting in 25th. But I think Vegas really does not like those practice numbers because Stenhouse opened at 1,800 and then he dropped 1,533. So, I mean, they're probably relying a little bit too much on these practice numbers, but I think Stenhouse should be a top 10 contender for the most part. I would not mind being overweight on him in tournaments just from a game theory point of view because all these guys can very easily get wrecked. We do not really know what to expect in this race and Let's say a guy like Radic or Bell happened to wreck out. I mean, this can be a lot of ownership that just gets wiped down. If Stenhouse can just kind of hang around and get a top 10, top 5 finish, I know that's not amazing because I don't think he's going to front and dominate, but the potential is there for it. So I don't hate him. I mean, he's not my favorite play. I'd much rather play like in a vacuum. I'd much rather play Briscoe, Reddick, and Bell. It just makes more sense to me. And I'm assuming my projections will like them a little bit more than Stenhouse. But if you want to lower own pivot, I don't mind Stenhouse as an option there. But a guy I really do like in all formats, especially in cash games, we have Chase Briscoe below $10,000, and he's one of the better dirt track racers in the entire field here. And looking at his Vegas odds, he went from opening at 2000 now he's down to 1600 400 points in his favor. Also top 10 in Vegas rank to win this race, and didn't have a bad guard in practice either. Was 12th in practice 2 in the 10 lap, and then in practice 1, obviously those numbers aren't very impressive, but I like what I saw in practice 2, and he's in pretty good equipment, he's good at dirt tracks. He's got some Eldora numbers to, to look at as well. He has three races, average finish of 3.7, has a win, a lot of laps led, been in the top 10 every single time. So Chase Briscoe starting back in 25th, definitely think he's going to be a very, very popular play on Sunday, and deservedly so. Then Austin Dillon at $9,700, starting in 9th. I feel like he's a very, very interesting tournament play here, and people are going to be very scared of these practice numbers, but I was looking into it, and I, and I guess Austin Dillon was kind of sandbagging it a bit, kind of saving his equipment. So he wasn't really running as hard as he could have. And we know Austin Dillon's very good at dirt tracks. Looking at the Vegas odds, I believe he opened up as the third best favorite to win this race. And he was getting a lot of practice in the Nationals and things like that. And he was looking really good, won some races as well. As you can see, as the X for the recent week's experience at Bristol. But those practice numbers really, really dragged down his odds, which does have him ranked outside the top 10 in odds to win. So... I think Vegas kind of overreacted a bit on that. And I don't think Austin Dillon's out of the equation to win this race. Looking at his Eldora numbers, average finish of 5.7, has a win, has some lap sled as well. But I don't hate Austin Dillon here. He's going to be strictly a tournament play for me because he's priced right in between Briscoe and the dirt track ringer himself starting all the way back in 30 seconds. So he's a tournament play for me, but you can definitely get some leverage on him because there's definitely going to be some much more chalkier options than Austin Dillon. And people will be scared of those practice numbers for sure. 
And then dropping down to our first dirt track ringer, like I mentioned a little bit ago, we have Stuart Friesen starting all the way back in 32nd. Now, all the ringers, they're starting in the back because they're filling in for some other cup drivers who are really not in the best of equipment. So that makes them a little bit risky, but for where they're starting, it kind of offsets that a bit. The problem is Friesen's really expensive, but I would say he's my favorite of all the dirt track ringers because his equipment's not the worst of all the other guys. He's in the 77 car for Spire Motorsports. We've seen Justin Haley pilot this car to some at least some halfway decent finishes relative to the equipment that he's in. So, I mean, I think we certainly have some top 15 upside here for Stuart Friesen. And looking at his Vegas odds, he's actually sitting in 15th for his odds to win. And that's actually, that's actually after coming down quite a bit because he opened at 1,600. Then he put up some pretty bad practice numbers, which I'm not going to put in too much for these dirt guys because they have plenty of experience. And I can't imagine Friesen was going too hard in practice. So I think we have legitimate top 15 upside here from Friesen. And starting all the way back in 32nd, I think that makes him an excellent play, and especially in cash game formats just to get that nice place differential upside that he offers you. And then after Friesen, I'm going to group these guys together because they're all in very similar spots. They're similarly priced, and they're some of the best drivers in the field and some of the best equipment. So we have Ryan Blaney at $9,300 starting all the way up in third. Denny Hamlin starting in second at $9,100. And Kyle Busch at $8,900 starting in fourth. Now one thing you should keep in mind is that Kyle Larson, who would be the main obvious pick to dominate early on, he is going to the rear. So that's going to open the door for these guys to dominate early. And I want to mention one thing Bob tweeted because I know I'm going to get questions with Larson dropping to the rear. Who's going to be the control car? Who's going to be up front? So direct quote from Bob because I don't want to mess this up. Larson drops to the rear for an engine change. Hamlin does not get lane choice, but he is the control car for the start in the outside lane. Blaney, who will be the, will be front on the inside, can't beat him to the start finish line at the initial start of the race. So, I mean, I think there's a decent chance one of those guys can pick up the early dominator points. Kyle Busch will be in the mix as well. And I'm actually a Pretty big fan of Kyle Busch in tournaments this week. I think he's got a decent chance of winning. One thing I should mention, some people are thinking we're going to see some regular Bristol conditions at the end of this race, the way it's going to happen. So if that's the case, I mean, Kyle Busch has some amazing numbers at Bristol. I mean, even last year when we didn't have practice and things like that, Kyle Busch came out and was a dominator with Bristol races. So I would definitely bid on some Kyle Busch. I think he might be a sneaky pick to win the race. Looking at the odds, if I can pull that up for you guys really quick. And he was pretty good in practice, too. If you guys like the practice numbers, in practice, one, one, his 10 lap average is pretty bad, but in practice too, he got inside the top 10, was fifth in the 15 lap and second in the 20 lap, although only a few drivers ran 20 laps in practice number two. But his odds for this race, he's got the eighth best odds to win. He went from 1800 to 1500, so 300 points in his favor. So I don't think Kyle Busch is the worst play in the world. As for Denny Hamlin and Ryan Blaney, I mean, Denny Hamlin was pretty fast in practice. He was second in the 10 lap in practice number two, third in the five lap, and fourth in the 15 lap. And he's going to have the control to start at the race as well, so that can work in his favor. The problem is he's not going to have lane choice. And that's going to be that's going to work in Blaney's favor, but it's just definitely tricky to want to roster these guys up front because I mean it could be an absolute wreck fest, and we're going to want those place differential guys if that's going to be the case. Because if these guys wreck up front, I mean they're getting you a lot of negative points. I mean, just go back to how you build lineups at a super speedway. I mean these guys up front are typically pretty risky and I don't full fade them. I have lower ownership on them, but this isn't going to be exactly like a super speed bike. These guys, there's 250 laps here and they could easily, you know, lead a decent chunk of those first 50 laps for the competition caution. And even then you can't lose stop. You can't lose positions on pit road. So I wouldn't be surprised if Denny Hamlin, Ryan Blaney, Kyle Busch led a decent amount of laps. And if they happen to have a top five finish, they could be optimal at their price point. So I wouldn't full fade them. Don't think I'd get there in cash games, but I do. I don't mind them in tournaments. And I know Blaney said that their their team is using a lot of his father's notes because he had some experience on dirt track, so that could work in his favor as well. And his odds aren't too bad to win this race. He's actually sitting at six, tied with Denny Hamlin and right in front of Kyle Busch. So don't hate any of those guys, but really only for tournaments. Then Chase Elliott, eighty-seven hundred dollars. He's starting all the way back in twenty-six. It's going to be really hard to pass up Chase Elliott. His practice numbers were pretty good. I know he's been getting a lot of dirt track experience. He actually gets one of the X's here for recent Bristol dirt track experience. So that'll be a plus for me this week as well. Super fast in practice was top five in the 10 lap average in practice number two. He has the fifth best odds to win this race over in Vegas as well. So Chase Light starting all the way back in 26. Probably going to be a pretty popular play here. Deservedly so. I'm always a big fan of playing Chase Elliott. And I would not be surprised if he's running for a top 10 finish here. And he was actually top 5 in both practices as well in the 10 lap averages. So definitely like Chase Elliott here. I think he's a very, very, very strong. And to be honest, I probably won't be playing much out of these guys. Maybe like a handful for percentage in my lineups. But it won't be anything too crazy. And definitely wouldn't touch them in single entry or three entry max tournaments. 
Well, the odds for Lugano and Truex aren't bad, though. 10th best, but the problem is they're starting inside the top 10, so the upside is limited, but their price tags aren't terrible. So if they can hold their positions and all the other place differential guys happen to have issues, it's not the worst thing in the world, but I don't love it. Then dropping down to the 7K range, we have Kurt Busch at 7800 bucks. He's starting all the way back in 28th. Not a ton of dirt track experience for him, but he wasn't too bad in practice this number two as he was top 10 in the 10 lap average coming in 8th place and his odds to win this race are sitting in 17th. So again, it's not amazing, but that's not terrible either starting nearly 30th place. So I definitely think he's in play just because of where he's starting. I don't think he's going to be a really like a top 5 or top 10 or a race winning kind of guy, but starting in 28th, I think he's going to move up some spots. His equipment's good enough to do that. So I'm definitely in on some Kurt Busch exposure because of that starting position. And then an interesting guy this week is Alex Bowman at $7,100 starting in 7th. So not a ton of dirt guy. Like all these guys priced down low aren't the biggest dirt guys besides some of the ringers who just happen to be in some pretty subpar equipment. But Alex Bowman, he was killing it in practice and his odds definitely shifted a lot in his favor. I mean, he's opened at 3,500. He's now down to 1,100 and the fourth best odds to win this race. I'm not really sure if I'm willing to go that far, but I definitely like the speed he showed in practice. He was fifth in this 10 lap average in practice two. And then in practice number one, he was second in that. Then he was on the pole for the one lap speed. So Alex Bowman definitely is showing quite a bit of speed. And you know, the track's going to change quite a bit. So I'm not really sure how much I want to put into these practice speeds, but I don't know. It's just going to be really interesting. And I'm I'm not really sure how this race is going to pan out. That's why I'm saying I'm kind of leaning towards the guy starting further in the back because it's just a safer way to go about things. But I like the speed he was showing. I think people are going to play him because of that speed. So if he's going to go a little bit over owned because of that, I wouldn't mind. I wouldn't hate being underweight on that. But I will have a little bit of Alex own exposure just because of the speed he showed. But I don't think I'm going to do anything too crazy. But it was definitely encouraging to see. Also, he's in a Hendrick car, which have been fantastic all year. And you know, we've had some drivers say the equipment still will matter. And especially if this track gets to the point where we're starting to see some regular Bristol guys come to the front. I think Kyle Larson said that in an interview. I don't know if it was this week, but it was earlier on. In the week. Might have been this week. But either way, I'm not saying Alex Bowen's amazing at Bristol, but Still, I think these Hendrick cars should definitely show some speed here. I like Larson, Elliott, Bowman. Even Byron's odds went in his favor quite a bit. We'll talk about him in a little bit. I don't know if that's because of how he did in iRacing, which I would not put iRacing statistics into this whatsoever. But Alex Bowman's an interesting play just because of the speed that he has showed this weekend. Then Brad Keselowski at $7,500. bucks. he's starting all the way back in 20th. The practice numbers weren't terrible for him. In practice number two, he was 7th in the 5 lap, 14th in the 10 lap, and 12th in the 15 lap. Kind of slimmer numbers to practice number one. The problem is, I don't know, I don't have high expectations here for Brad Keselowski. He's got the 17th best odds in Vegas to win this race, which is kind of close to where he's starting. I don't think he's going to finish outside the top 20, but I mean, the ceiling here is probably not insane for him. He does have one outdoor race, but he did finish 28th, but... At least he does have some experience with that, at least a little bit. But I'm not super high in Keselowski, but starting 20th, it's at least somewhat appealing. And then we have a couple ringers here. We have Chris Wind at $7,400, starting all the way back in 36. The problem with these guys, like him and Mike Marler, equipment sucks. Like he's in the 15 car, which is usually what James Davison's in. I mean, these guys just, the equipment's not that great. And then Marler's in the 66 car with Timmy Hill, and that car is old. It sucks. I feel like Timmy Hill is in the garage within lap 10 almost every single race. So it's hard to trust the equipment here. I mean, they're starting pretty far back. So there's potential here, but we're talking probably like a mid twenties finish for these guys, which again, is not that bad. So let's just say Wyndham who, let's say he finishes 25th in that race. Is it amazing? No, but if he happens to finish in 25th here, let's pull up the heat sheet or the heat map. That would be roughly around 28, 27 points, which is not the worst thing in the world. So I mean, he's in play. I just don't feel like the ceiling is like a top 10, top 15 finish. It's there because they got dirt experience. It's just tough to trust for sure. If you want to see their Vegas odds really quick. So Wyndham's sitting at the 23rd best odds and the same for the other guy as well. So, I mean, I think they could probably finish in that 20 to 25th place range, which it's not amazing, but it's not that bad either. William Byron's $7,100. He is starting back in eighth. Practice one didn't go too well for him. It was 23rd in the 10 lap. And then in practice number two, he was inside the top 10, finishing in seventh there. Now his odds, he's one of the biggest movers in the entire field here. He opened up at 6,600. Now he's down to $2,500, which is over 4,000 in difference there. Now it's the 12th best odds to win this race. Problem is he's starting eighth. I feel like he's, I'm not sure if he's going to get a top eight finish. He might lose a spot or two, but he could be a top 10 contender. Problem is we just have other guys that can gain the spots here, like Ty Dillon, J.J. Yaley. I mean, even Ryan Priest and Chris Busch are starting even further back, and I feel like the upside maybe 
Maybe they won't finish as high as William Byron, but I mean, they're still starting a little bit further back, which makes them safer. So I'm not huge on Byron. I mean, I know the odds are really shifting in his favor, but even then he only has one Eldora race. He finished 14th, ran 150 laps. It's not anything amazing. So I won't be over, have an overabundance of William Byron this week. Then dropping down to Ryan Newman, $1,600. He is starting in 14th. He has plenty of dirt experience, was an amazing in practice, but it was 11th in the 10 lap in practice number two, which is not that bad. His odds for this race are 20th. I feel like he could be a bit better than that. His actually odds did drop, not in his favor, but he does have two Odor races, average finish of 16.5, had a top five finish, ran 302 laps, so at least he had some experience on dirt tracks recently starting in 14th it's going to be hard to want to play a lot of him but i do think he's an interesting tournament play because he is kind of sandwiched in between a lot of place differential guys so don't hate newman in tournaments but wouldn't get there in cash games and this next guy is definitely a ringer here now he's kind of in that situation with the other guys we talked about where he's not in the best of equipment because he is riding in that 78 car for bj mcleod but that hasn't been the worst car out there this year but starting all the way back in 35th at 6800 dollars I definitely think he's in play. And if you want to talk about his dirt track experience, he's certainly got a lot of that. He's earned 83 feature wins in his career. I'm going off of an article here, but 83 feature wins in his career. He's won in the World of Outlaws and the USAC National Midget Series and some other stuff as well. So he's definitely got quite a bit of experience. Now his practice numbers were pretty poor, so there's nothing to hang your hat on. His odds in Vegas are also 31st to win, but I feel like he could still be a top 30 guy here. Maybe hang with the other guys and you know, the other ringers. Maybe not up to Friesen's level, but... I don't hate him just as a place differential guy. I don't think the upside's crazy high, but the floor is pretty high for him, which is not the worst thing in the world at his price point. Matt Benedetto at 6700 bucks. He's starting in 12th. He's just one of those guys where he's starting so far up, it's going to make him pretty risky when we have a lot of place differential guys down low. So I can't see myself having too much MDB. I know he's in a Penske car. He's got some dirt experience, but his odds in Vegas are sitting at 21 right now. No Adora numbers, so... I don't really like Matthew Benedetto too much. I might get a sprinkle of him at 150 max, but that's about it. Wouldn't go there in cash or single entry. But the next guy might be the highest owned guy in the slate. I'm not kind of trying to decide on how ownership's going to look like. But for the cheaper guys, Ty Dillon, starting all the way back on 39th, for a guy that has a lot of dirt track experience, he's kind of like the go-to guy here because he can really make your lineup work and he can't lose you points. And at a track where I think there might be a lot of chaos and wrecks, if this was a super speedway and Ty Dillon starting 39th, he would be my highest owned driver. So if we apply that same strategy, yeah, I like Ty Dillon quite a bit. Now, equipment matters like not at all at a super speedway. It's still going to matter here a little bit, but I don't think it's going to matter too much. But even at Bristol, we had some decent runs at Bristol if you want to talk about regular Bristol. But he's got quite a bit of dirt track experience, and that's all I can really ask for for a guy that's in this cheap range. He has five Aldora races since 2013. 760 laps ran, which is more than anybody here. So I like the experience, going to work in his favor. His practice numbers obviously weren't anything to write home about, but starting all the way in the back, you can't lose any points at a track where I think place differential is going to be pretty key. You can sign me up for a lot of Austin Dillon on this slate. JJ Yaley, he's got some dirt track experience as well. Obviously, the car is not great, but starting back on 34th, I certainly think he's viable. And if you want to get off that Ty Dillon chalk, you could go directly to JJ Yaley. Obviously, I'd much rather play Ty Dillon. I know he's in the 96 car, which obviously is not that great, but it's better than the 53 car, I will say that. But JJ Yaley, I don't think he's going to have a terrible day, and he should certainly gain you some spots. So I think both these guys are definitely in play. Obviously, you prefer Ty, but you can play Yaley as well. And then after that, we have a bunch of man plays here Chris Busher he's just running so far up I don't have too much interest his practice numbers weren't terrible but they're kind of right around where he's gonna where he's starting so there's not a ton of upside there I don't hate it I think there's maybe some sneaky top 10 potential there but his odds in Vegas aren't that great and even then I just I don't really love Chris Busher I can't imagine I'll end up with too much of him Ryan Priest the same way practice numbers weren't terrible starting 22nd He's viable. Like, I'm not going to go 100% Ty Dillon here. So I'll, I'll get some exposure to these guys down low besides Ty Dillon. But it's just going to be because I want to get a bit different. And this track is going to be very unpredictable. So just kind of mixing and matching your exposure down low so you can get those expensive guys in would certainly be a decent way to go. And you might not even have to go that cheap. I haven't built lineups yet, but you don't have to play guys like Tyler Reddick and Christopher Bell. You can make lineups starting with Chase Elliott. Wyndham, Kurt Busch, Friesen, and that's not even overkill because you don't have any guys above 10k, so I'm not sure exactly how cheap you're going to have to go. Obviously, you're going to have some lineups with guys like Reddick and Bell where you're going to have to go cheap, so I mean, either way, I would just kind of mix and match down low for the most part. Eric Amarola, though, $5,800 starting in 23rd. He's got good equipment. The practice numbers weren't great. His odds in Vegas aren't very good either. Dirt track experience, yeah. These guys priced down lower, kind of priced than how their dirt track experience is. There's just not much there. So Amarola, 
He's cheap. He's in good equipment starting in the 20s. He can gain some spots, but I don't expect too much out of him here. Same goes for Eric Jones. Now, he does have an Eldora truck race under his belt, actually two of those. So at least that's a positive for him. Does have 24 laps led as well with an average finish of 16.5. Again, these guys down low, the numbers aren't going to look too great, but they are in some decent starting positions, which do make them viable relative to their price points. Cole Custer, kind of the same way as Eric Amarola and Eric Jones. Now, he's in Stuart Haas equipment, as is Eric Amarola, so that's definitely a plus for him, but their Vegas odds just aren't that great. But out of these three, Cole Custer has had the 21st best odds in Vegas to win, which is definitely above guys like Jones, Amarola, Priest, and even Busher and the other guys that we talked about, so that's a positive for him. It's actually the same odds as Matt Benedetto, and starting in 21st, Cole Custer is definitely not a bad play starting 21st. I actually think he's one of the better cheap 5K options down low. And then after that, I mean, we're just getting really cheap. We have Chastain and, Mike, and Michael McDowell. Chastain's numbers in practice weren't great in practice number one. In practice two, he was 17th in the 10 lap, which is actually right where he's starting. He could be a top 20 guy. The problem is he's starting 17th. The only thing you're playing for is because of that price point. His odds in Vegas aren't going to look that great. 27th best odds to win. Does have one Eldora truck race, but besides that, I mean, it's just going to be hard to trust some of these guys down low. Michael McDowell, practice number two. He was in the 20s. I feel like he's going to finish below where he's starting. The 23rd best odds in Vegas. Doesn't have an Eldora truck race under his belt. Then Corey LaJoy. Corey LaJoy is not a bad play because he's only $5,000 and he's starting all the way back in 30th. Now, I know his odds to win this race are 35th and just his practice numbers weren't super impressive, but he was 21st in the 10 lap in practice two and 18th in the in the 10 lap in practice number one. So I think he can certainly gain some spots here and he's absolutely dirt cheap. So I think he's actually a viable way to make some guys up top work in your lineup. Then Daniel Suarez, he's in 18th and he ran a lot of laps in practice. So I definitely like that he was getting some track time under his belt. Now you're going to see he's first in the 30 and 25 and five lap and he actually ran he was the only driver to get all of those each single, each and every single time. So I do like that he had a lot of track time. I like that he's below $5,000. He was eighth in the 15 lap in practice one. The problem is that there was only 13 drivers that did that. So it's kind of hard to draw a conclusion from that. But if we look at the 10 lap data, he was 22nd. So the problem is he's starting kind of far up inside the top 20 where he's not going to be the greatest player in the world. I might have a little bit just because he had so much practice time, or at least that's going to help him out a little bit. But I can't say I love where he's starting. Anthony Alfredo, practice numbers, 16th in practice number two, and 16th again in practice number one. If he could contend for a top 20 finish starting in 29th at $4,800, he would certainly be in play for me. So he's firmly a price play. Josh Balicki, Cody Ware, and Quinn Half. I can't imagine I'd have too much of these guys. I know they actually ran a lot of laps in practice, but even then, it's going to be hard to want to play these guys. I don't think we're going to have to go this low as well. I might have like 1% or 2% of these guys because they are starting in the back, and like I said, I'm going to want drivers in the back. And Josh Balicki starting all the way back in 37. So he can't really hurt you too much. It's just, it's going to be kind of hard to trust these guys with the kind of equipment they're in. And I, there's, I just don't think we're going to have to go that low too much unless you're going crazy high on stars and scrubsy for the most part. But yeah, guys, I think it's going to be it for the video. If you made it all the way through, please let me know. I said it was going to be shorter than usual, but as I can see, we're at around 40 minutes. So I guess I lied. I always say that, then I always end up going long, but I appreciate you listening. I really do appreciate all the thumbs up, all the people that subscribe. If you want to check out the optimizer this week, if you happen to skip the intro, which I do know people do because I look at my analytics, which I totally get because I ramble quite a bit, but I do have a free to use optimizer this weekend only. Then it's going to add to another Patreon tier that you can sign up for. But if you want to check it out, completely free to use this week. You're going to have my own projections on there and ownership projections, rankings, all that fun stuff. I'll put a link down below. If you, want to, if you want to support me over on Patreon, there's options listed there as well. If you want to get a free money bonus up to $50 on Monkey Night Fight, use code CPEN at checkout, and you'll get a free money bonus up to $50 as an instant match deposit. So I think that's pretty much it, guys. Appreciate you watching, and I'll see you on the live stream tomorrow or today whenever you're watching this video.